students, you get free tickets. You just have to go online and um, log in, and you can get a free ticket. And so I encourage you to go and do that. Uh, that is worth a community life credit. And, um, and so you can and actually get credit for doing that. So come on out, support your, your fellow students and all the hard work they've been putting into it. It is coming along and it is really going to be a great show. So encourage you to do that. Second, we have an opportunity. Uh, I'm going to have Jewel come up. Uh, we have an opportunity to help those in need. As some of you may have heard, there has been a hurricane that's hit Puerto Rico and we've had a student who's just, their, her heart's been moved to go and to help in some way. Not to go, but to help in some way. Uh, she's already been, but she wanted to help. And so uh, Jewel is going to come and she's going to share a little story about um, her experience and, and how she got, how the Lord's laid this on her heart and then ways we can help. Yeah, so in 2018, I actually had an opportunity to go to Puerto Rico. And while I was down there, um, Pastor Burt, who was kind of running the whole relief efforts, because we went down there six months after Hurricane Maria went through. And so he told us a story of when he was power washing the streets of Puerto Rico, he would come across so much debris and items. These items consisted of um, coins such as pennies and quarters. And every time he came across a quarter, he would pick it up. But every time he came across a penny, he would just leave it. I mean, why would he pick up a penny? It's basically worthless. And so the next day, he was power washing the streets once again, and he came across a penny. He passed it. And a few minutes later, God was just telling him, hey, go pick up that penny. So he went back and picked up the penny and prayed about why God needed him to pick up the penny. He later correlated the people, um, the penny with some of the people of Puerto Rico. They have very little and they're in great need of help, but they're also seen as sometimes worthless or not, or just forgotten. And so every time I see a penny, it reminds me that there are God's people out there that are in need of help. And so when I heard about, heard about Hurricane Fiona that just came through Puerto Rico a little over a week ago, I came across a penny. It reminded me of the devastation, the loss and suffering the people of Puerto Rico went through, and I saw it with my own eyes when I was there. So instead of passing the penny, I picked it up, and I sought this as an opportunity to do something for the people of Puerto Rico. There's not one penny, a.k.a. person, not worth helping. So I decided to put together a little collection drive and never forget the forgotten, because everyone is fearfully and wonderfully made in his image, and there's um, so much we can do as um, a community. And so, yeah, I just thought this was an opportunity to help those in need through his name and bring hope and faith to the Puerto Rico who are currently suffering. So, yeah, thank you. So if you want to check your email, there was an email that went out a list of things you can donate, or, or we do have a fund set up if you'd like to donate money. We can do that, and we uh, it will go straight to the pastor down in Puerto Rico so that he can use it, uh, boots on the ground, helping people and providing for their needs. And so uh, check out the email that went out to you already. We'll probably try to send that out again today or tomorrow, it's just so you it's a reminder to help uh, provide for those who are in desperate need right now. Um, and the last an thing that I want to do is I just want to say I am really excited for today's chapel. Our speaker, uh, his name is Santiago Fuentes, and, um, and he's coming, uh, yeah, to share with us a powerful message that God laid on his heart. But before we get to the speaker, I've actually asked Dalton uh, McAllister to come and read scripture uh, for today. And so Dalton's going to come and read scripture. And uh, so I'll give it up for Dalton. So our message today is going to come from um, Luke 9, 18 through 27. It says, now it happened that he was praying alone and the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell no one saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself. 
For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So yeah, like Ryan said, our, um, our speaker, Santiago uh, Fuentes, he's from Mexico City. He's with the organization Forge, you might have seen on the screen. Um, and so here's a short video, and after the video, we'll welcome him to the stage. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We are made in the image of the creator. He's the creator of the universe. He's powerful. He existed before the universe. Let's make disciples who make disciples. Let's multiply ourselves and expand this kingdom that God is talking about. Now, it's not just God among us, but God in us. Imagine the type of victory he had because of the power of God, not because he was a... It's good news for every single day of the week, for every moment, for every breath. He will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The goal for this message is that everybody out there would put your trust in God. I will make you fishers of men. I will disciple you, and you're going to get in this conflict of serving the needy, loving the lost, reaching these people. Because he didn't teach them an upfront plan. He taught them an up-close plan. It's time. It's time. Everything Jesus laid the foundation for at the cross and through the resurrection, you and I, he invites me, he invites you to have a part in his plan. This is a mission that I can walk out of the doors and be a part of right now. To share Jesus with them, to love them in action, to bring them into the kingdom, God has given you a race to run. To lay down your life to say, Jesus, I will feed your people. I will love your people. I will lead your people. I will do whatever you ask me to do. I'm yours. If not us, who? If not now, when? I'm saying it's us, and I'm saying it's now, and I'm saying it's you. Power to see results, to see his character in us, to see the fruit of your spirit, to overcome sin, to overcome temptation. Lord, we need you. We need you. So good to be, to be back here. I'm thrilled at the opportunity of being back here at Tabor College with you all. My name, like it was said, is Santiago Fuentes coming from Mexico City. And today I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open on Luke chapter 9 because we're going to spend some time there. The scripture was uh, read already. Let me tell you something. It's about time. Everything, it's about time. If you watch sports like I do, I love sports. When I, I have fond memories of watching the World Series with my dad. And he knew way more than I did. And so he would say, oh, they have to pull the pitcher out now. They have to pull it out. There it goes. Game tie. It's about the timing. You know, sports is about timing. What about football? It's about timing. The quarterback and wide receivers and, and tight ends and slot receivers, they need to be right on time. The pass needs to be a certain place, a certain point of, of, the, of the route of the wide receiver. It's, everything is about timing. What about relationships? It's also about timing. You know, you have to time things perfectly. I remember when I was dating my, my now wife, I was really... Um, in love and everything, and, and we loved each other. We had been together for a while, dating, and, uh, and one day we had this huge argument. And you would think that you, you propose when you're in love and you just had a great dinner together, and then it's like, oh, I'm gonna spend my life with this girl now. But guess what? We had a huge argument. And so we were like, okay, we're done. I don't want to see you anymore. You don't want to see me. That's fine. I, I don't care. Day one after the fight, I was like, I did the right thing. I mean, I'm, I'm right. Day two, I was like, I still think I'm right. I, uh. And day three, I was like, well, maybe I overreacted. And day four, man, I was, 
I was just stupid by saying these things. And day five, I was, I, I'm so silly. That's, it's, I'm just an idiot. I'm just going to go back and apologize. And guess what? That's when I decided I'm going to marry this girl. If I couldn't make it through five days without her, I'm not going to make it the rest of my life without her. It's about timing. You know, it's about timing. Uh, the scripture that was read before is Luke chapter 9. And the timing of this passage is really important. And then what is going to happen later down the road with these apostles is really important. You heard uh, Dalton reading for us Luke chapter, 19, two, chapter 9 verse 18. One day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him and he asked them, who do people say I am? It's about the timing. Have you ever asked, asked a question in the wrong timing? I remember I was sitting next to my buddy, my long, uh, long-time friend, and we visited his, uh, his girlfriend's, her girlfriend's uh, uh, home, and there was the dad. And he was dating the daughter, the only daughter of the family. And, and so we sat there, and we were talking with the dad, and then the dad said, I heard you propose to my daughter. Ooh, I was like... I don't want to be here. I wanted to sink in, in my chair. Like, that's between you two guys. You, you, you deal with it. I'm not here. You know, those questions at the, at the right time or the wrong time, man, this, this question Jesus asked was in perfect timing. But you got to be careful with what you read here because Jesus was saying these things in Caesarea Philippi, if you, if you flip the pages of your Bible really quick to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? So Matthew tells us the context, where they were. Luke doesn't say that, but this was Caesarea Philippi. If you're not aware of what was going on there, that was a place, one of the many places actually, where Roman emperors had their temples built. They worshipped the Roman emperor in Caesarea Philippi. And not worshipping the, the Roman emperor was betraying the Roman Empire. And that was punished with death. Now, second thing there was in Caesarea Philippi, the temple to the god Pan. P-A-N, Pan. And the temple to God Pan was, the God Pan was the, the God of shepherds and flocks. So that's why he was half goat, half human. You've seen Narnia, the fawn, right? Just picture that one. That's half man, half goat. And that was the, 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 uh, the uh, God Pan. In fact, uh, in, in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, they play the the, the flute of Pan. Have you seen that? It's got several tubes. It's because this, this god played that kind of flute. So they called it the, the Pan flute. And that god was worshipped with immorality. Because guess what? In biblical times, they thought goats were very active sexually. So therefore, god Pan was worshipped with immorality. So there you have it. Worshipping the Roman emperor, worshipping the god Pan... But there was some superstition and some more ideas running around. And in this place where Jesus asked this question, where he asked this question, who do people say I am? There, were, there was, and there's still there, this huge rock, like a, the size of a mountain, little hill, that has got a cave. And people thought those are the gates of hell. You go, the, of hell. You go to hell through that cave you go to the underworld if you step foot if you set foot into that cave now i'm thinking if i should change my my message to daniel in the lion's den because this is really risky so i, I gotta work the stage a little bit better i'm getting close so so there you have it. That's what, that's what, what was going on. The, all this worshiping and all this superstition in Caesarea Philippi where Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they said, remember, shout the, the answers. You are maybe Elijah 
for one of the ancient prophets, right? That's what they said. That's what they answered. It's there. And then he asked a question. Get it right, go to heaven. Get it wrong, you're doomed. And who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? The most important question in everybody's life. Who do you say Jesus is? Not because we define Jesus, because we don't. We just recognize who he is by how he has revealed himself in scripture. Who do you say Jesus is? In, in, in a college, in, a, in an academic setting like this, you're used to having tests, right? You're used to quizzes. You're used to raise your hand and ask questions or, or being asked questions by your professors. None of those are important. Different fields of knowledge. All of that is important for your training, for your development as a professional in certain field. But the, the greatest question there is, the one we all need to answer during this lifetime, is who do you say Jesus is? Get it right. You're in heaven. You remember Slumdog Millionaire? In Mexico, many years ago, when I was a kid, we had this, this, uh, this TV show. The 64 million question was the name of the, of the show. And they would ask some questions, some really easy questions that, that even a kid like me was able to answer at the beginning of the show. But then the questions were tougher and tougher because they were not just going to give... Uh, 60 million pesos away, right? They were, they were going to make it tough on you. But I remember sitting there next to my siblings just getting excited. Man, this guy is going to get it. This lady is going to get it. She's going to go all the way. She's going to get the 64 million pesos. Because then the questions were so tough. Barely anybody got the 64 million peso. Get this one right. You're in. This passage is so loaded with so many things. It's not just Jesus telling them, uh, asking the question, who do you say I am? And Peter, probably Peter uh, responding for everybody, like the spokesperson for the whole group. You are the Messiah. In Luke's version, it says you are the Messiah sent from God. In Matthew's version of this passage, he said, you're the son of God. You're the son of the living God. You're the Christ, the Messiah. But you know what strikes me the most about this passage? Verse 21, Luke 9, verse 21. Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. Made me scratch my head for so long. What in the world? They've been waiting for centuries. They've been waiting for centuries for their Messiah. And now that he's there, now that he's revealed, now that they can see this is the Messiah we've been waiting for. He says, oh, but keep it, keep it to yourselves, guys. Don't tell anybody. Have you, have you kept a secret for somebody? Have you kept a secret? I remember when my brother was about to propose to his now, wife, he told me, I want you to come with me to Mexico City's downtown. There's lots of things to do in Mexico City's downtown. If, you're, if you've never been there, you've got to come and experience it. There's so much going on, all kinds of museums, all kinds of palaces, you know, from, from uh, colonial times that you can visit. There's so much going on there. And with my brother, my oldest brother, we had been there many, many times. So when he said, let's go downtown... I was like, whatever, it's just another day. It's going to be fun, but nothing special, particularly. And then we stopped at this jewelry uh, shop. And he started looking around, engagement rings. And I was like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I got to get a ring for Patty. That's the name of his wife. You're going to break this bond. You're going to leave me. You're going to ditch me, man. What's wrong with you? It's time. It's time for me to settle down. I love her. Well, it's about the timing, isn't it? We said it's about time. And right here in this passage, 
the, the disciples are to keep a secret, like I had to keep a secret for my brother. And, he, and, and I told him when he finally chose, because they take some time, right? Choosing a ring for your future wife takes some time. And finally, when he made up his mind, he said, oh, but don't say it. Don't tell mom. Don't tell Patty, of course. Don't tell anybody. Keep it to yourself. What in the world? This is the greatest news in our family since forever, since I, since I was born, actually. <laughs> and now you want me to keep it to myself. And these apostles were asked the same, keep it to yourself, guys. Don't say it. Why? Well, then Jesus proceeded to tell them, the Son of Man will suffer and he will die. And then he will be raised up. It's so loaded, this passage, with so many things. Because after saying that, he said, and if anybody wants to follow me. They must deny their se themselves. They have to pick up their cross and they have to follow me. If you would ask me, if you would, you would give me the chance to try to put it into uh, different, slightly different words, I would say, if anybody is burning with desire to follow me, you have to make up your mind today and deny once and for all yourself and pick up your cross today and then keep following me for the rest of your life. One decision that will change it all. Because whoever is ashamed of me or my message, I will be ashamed of them before my father. You see that the Lord Jesus told them, keep it to yourselves, guys. This territory we're in is extremely dangerous. There is this huge cathedral in Mexico City where Jesus is not worshipped. But Virgin of Guadalupe is worshipped. She is said to be co-redemptive with Jesus. That denies the sufficiency of Jesus' atonement, of Jesus' death for sin. Every year, December the 12th, every year, over one million people show up to worship Virgin of Guadalupe. And some come kneeling with cactus on their knees for miles and miles, hurting themselves because they think their belief is, I need to make, make something to, to appease God. Denying that Jesus then already made our peace with God through his death and resurrection. Imagine you go there on December the 12th and start preaching about Jesus. Hey guys, forget it. This is worthless. This is a big building, beautiful building. But guess what? It's, it's worth nothing before God. You think what? Can you imagine what would happen to you? Surrounded with a million people? It probably would happen what happened last, last year. I'm going next month to Huejutla, Mexico. That's kind of center Mexico, to, a little bit to the north. To strengthen and train up pastors there. Pastors who have no access pretty much to the internet. Pastors that have almost close to zero access to any kind of theological or biblical training, but pastors who are faithful. I was there last year teaching for a weekend, and uh, we were led by a sweet man in worship, and then I went back home to Mexico City. A week after I went back home, they texted me this picture of this worship leader beaten up with a tooth loss. Asking for prayer for him and his church. Because they broke into the church service and beat up the pastor, him, and other members of his church. Why? Because they proclaimed Jesus. In Caesarea Philippi, it was dangerous to talk about Jesus. And, and, and so what? You know, Jesus is there. He can stop the crowd. He can do anything. Yes, but this was not the time. It's about timing. 
Jesus was yet to be crucified and raised from the dead, they needed the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And then they would be witnesses. Right? Doesn't it say that? Acts chapter 1. I couldn't go, I could have gone to, to uh, the version of, of Matthew, but the reason I went with the version of, of Luke for these verses is because the first volume is the Gospel of Luke. Second volume is the book of Acts. Go to the book of Acts chapter 1. And you know what I'm going to read. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It was not the time. It was not the time. Not because it was dangerous. But because Jesus needed to be ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit needed to be poured out. And then they would preach. And then they would be unstoppable. And then no one, no one would stop them from telling about Jesus. You know what? I look at these verses and I think, what's stopping me? What's stopping us from going full in? What's stopping us from going full speed with Jesus? What's stopping us from going 100% all in to reach out to others, to preach the gospel? And I don't think it's going to take a few itinerant speakers. I am part of a team of itinerant speakers with Forge. I don't think it's going to take 100 pastors. I train up pastors back home. But I think it's going to take an army of all of us invading every space and place with the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one, no one is left out from being part of this team that God is putting together. Because when he saved you, he recruited you. You're part of his army. Now you're his. Now you take his light and his love everywhere. You're called to go all in with Jesus. Because for those guys, they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. They didn't even have the full revelation of God. They were the ones who wrote it down. But we do have the message. We do have the calling. We have the commandment. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Bible. We have the church. We have everything we need to go full in, to go all in. And take the gospel to every corner of the world. Isn't that exciting? I think we are in exciting times. I'm, I'm working with, with a group of churches in, in South Carolina to put satellite uh, internet in remote villages of Mexico. That way we're going to train up pastors from the distance. Through Zoom. Or whatever platform. But... We're going to train them up and raise them up and strengthen the churches for them to go do the, the work of the ministry. Not for us. It's, these are amazing times. How, how fast you can travel from one place to another. Yesterday I was in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. I slept here, Hillsborough, last night. It's so easy. It's so easy. On Thursday I'm flying back home. I'm supposed to be at 1 in one airport. I'm supposed to be at 8 eight o'clock in Mexico City, landing in Mexico City. We can take the gospel anywhere. And if we don't, who is going to do it? Oh, man. All the, the energy of youth. Because I was out there and I, and I hear the laughter. And I, and I hear you guys talking and just having fun and just being young. Man, if you would surrender that to Jesus, if you would just give it all to him, if you, would, if you would go full speed chasing his mission. Oh, if you and I who are not as young, but we have experience and we've lived and maybe we have some more means than all these youngsters. Because now we have steady jobs, right? We're not in college. We're not broke anymore. 
But if we, if we would go all in with Jesus. Oh, those of you talented that can lead worship, that can play musical instruments, that can play uh, uh, theater, that can do many things, if you would surrender that to Jesus. All of you right minds also, not just to, to, with those artistic abilities, but those of you going into the medical field, into the business world, if you would surrender God, I'm going to be a businessman, but I want to be a businessman for you. I want to take the gospel to those places where many of us will never enter because we don't even know the language. Oh, we fall of you, myself included, if all of us would give it all to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm going to live my life in whatever field of society you called me. But I'm going to take your light. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to be different. I'm, going to, I'm not going to live under the standard of the world, but under the standard of your word. And I'm going to take your love, and I'm going to love on people. And the greatest act of love you can do for somebody is tell them about Jesus. They called me one day, and they said, Santi, can you come and talk to this old lady? And I said, I don't know this old lady, so give me more uh, references about her. I'm willing to come. And they say, um, she's, she's on her deathbed. She's not a Christian. All her family is together because the doctor said, just gather all the family. Just, this is just a matter of, of uh, a few hours before she passes. So I went to the house, and the, the place was packed. Uh, this lady, this was an old lady who had a big family, many, many children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It was a group like of 50 people in just a tiny Mexican house. And there I went, and they told me, uh, please come. And she's, she's on her bed. And so I went to, to her bed, and I stood by her side. And I looked up, and there were all these collection of idols that she used to pray to. And the daughter told me, would you give her some comfort? Would you just calm her down, read maybe some verses of the Bible for her? <laughs> and I was just standing there thinking, will I sugarcoat her way to hell? Or will I proclaim Jesus? Right here, right now. It was tough. Because I knew the, what the reaction would be. I knew it wasn't going to be welcome if I preached the gospel. So I had to pray. I opened my Bible. And I went exactly. Yes, you guessed it. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And as soon as I started preaching the gospel, somebody grabbed me by the arm and said, that's enough. Thank you, but that's enough. And I said, just give me one more minute. Didn't let go of my arm. So I continued to preach the gospel. And then I felt another hand. You're done. Well, just, can I, can I just go one more minute? No, you're done. They pulled me out of the room. Are you just going, going to sugarcoat the way to hell for people? Or are you going to blast them with the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ? If you're called into vocational ministry, great. But if you're not, great too. We need you out there. We need you in the trail of the academic world, of the arts world, of the business world. Every field in society, we need to fill it up with the light and the love of Jesus. Making a difference. Preaching Jesus to all men everywhere.
for some of you, this morning might be a time to, to do business with Jesus. To clean it up. Clean up your life and say, you know what, Jesus? I've been co covering your light. Hiding it. For some of you, it's time to say, Lord, I'm going to take your love and spread it in every field of society, everywhere you take me. I know that for me, it was when I was in college when that decision ma was made. And probably for some of you, it's today. And probably for some of you, it's time to realize, yes, I got to go all in. I got to go all in. I'm not going to play, play it safe, Jesus. I'm going to go full speed towards whatever you want me to do in the places and spaces you put me in. Can we pray? Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, you stopped your disciples for just a moment. Just until redemption was accomplished. Just until you sent your spirit, as we read on the day of Pentecost. But for us, we have it all. We have it all. We have your Holy Spirit. We have your full revelation in the Bible. We have the message. We have the command to go. Then the ball is on our court. It's on our side. It's our move. And it's about time some of us make that move. Maybe as I've been praying and I've been uh, preaching, the Lord has brought some faces and names to your mind. What's going to be of them? Maybe you don't even know their names. Maybe you just know them as the, the, the waitress, the waiter, the cashier, the guy at the gas station. But you know God is calling you to reach them with the light and love of Jesus. If that is you, maybe you want to commit today to take the gospel to them. I have my eyes closed. I'm not going to look. This is between you and God. But sometimes standing up helps our resolutions. I'm standing up because I have people in my mind I'm going to go back home and preach to. I know they need Jesus, but if you know somebody that needs Jesus and you know that no one else in this campus is going to reach out to them because that's a personal connection you have, please stand up and tell Jesus I'm going to. Yes, I'm going. I'm going to take your love and your light. And I'm going to do it fast. Of the many promises in the Bible, guess what? Tomorrow is not promised. Thousands of promises in the Bible, but tomorrow is not promised. So do it today. Jesus, we're standing before you. First of all, because we love you and we want to obey you and we want to serve you. We're making a commitment today. Please use us. You've given everything we need, and it's about time that we go all in to take the gospel in every space of society. May you bless our effort with the power of your Holy Spirit, the transforming power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in your name, Jesus.
Amen. Thank you.